There's so little we know about early human development, especially the period between two and four weeks after conception. This is a critical time when many miscarriages happen and birth defects can form. Researchers at the University of Michigan have developed a new method for making stem cell colonies that provides a window into this period. It could also lead to better fertility treatments and medication screening. In this episode of Reengineering Radio, join Michigan Engineering's Kate McAlpine for a deep dive into this research and the tough questions that come along with it. Opening the Black Box of Human Development It is difficult to study the journey from a single cell to a human infant, unfolding like a miracle in the dark of the womb. But sometimes it seems less than miraculous. We don't know why embryo after embryo miscarried, why this child has a cleft lip, a heart murmur, a club foot, why her spine didn't close, why his brain didn't form. There is more pain in these mysteries than we are equipped to express in one episode. But one of our engineers is a pioneer in a new field looking for explanations. Jean-Ping Fu, an associate professor of mechanical engineering, works closely with Deborah Gamuccio, the James Douglas Engel Collegiate Professor and a Professor Emerita of Cell and Developmental Biology at the University of Michigan. They use stem cells to model parts of very early embryos. They are among a few groups around the world using human stem cells to gain new insights into the crucial but essentially unobservable window when the embryo's cells take their first steps into organizing into a body. Gamuccio described a great group of images called the Carnegie Embryo Collection at the National Museum of Health and Medicine. It captures human embryos from implantation all the way to the fetal stage. But they're just individual static pictures. They don't say anything about cell dynamics. And cell dynamics are critical in these early weeks, as an embryo goes from a bundle of identical cells to a miniature body with the beginnings of limbs and organs. A small mistake here can bring on a miscarriage or have lifelong consequences. So researchers want to study what goes right, what goes wrong, and whether there's a way to prevent problems from arising. Lab-grown embryos could broaden our view, but the ethics are complex. At present, these embryos must be destroyed before they reach 14 consecutive days of development, in accordance with international conventions. It may be that some important questions could be answered without growing whole embryos, by instead building partial model embryos out of stem cells. One prominent ethicist argues that this field stands outside the scope of conventional bioethics and engineering ethics, requiring us to weigh risk, cost, and benefit in new ways because the question at the core of the problem has no good answer. When does a clump of cells become human? Part 1. Moral Status Western thought has been divided on when human cells gain the moral status of a human being for as long as we have written records. Conception, 40 days after conception, and the first breath are historically popular milestones. Developmental biology and medicine have unveiled the timing of more thresholds that many find significant. The heart's future pacemaker cells start signaling around three weeks after conception, sometimes referred to as a heartbeat, even though the heart will take a few more weeks to form. The first brain activity begins at roughly six weeks, near the 40-day mark, coincidentally. The earliest surviving premature births are in the 22nd week, about halfway to full term. In the early 1980s, researchers, ethicists, and public servants in the United Kingdom reached a compromise with these multitudes of perspectives. The Warnock Report of 1984 recommended that researchers should be allowed to study human embryos for up to 14 days. It enabled research that explained aspects of infertility, and it continues to support the improvement of IVF treatments. The timing was chosen in part because that's the moment when the embryo becomes a single individual, it can no longer split into identical twins. This standard was adopted around the world. But an international standard is not a law. In the U.S., there is no federal law on embryo research. The restrictions at the national level are on tax dollars. Federal agencies don't fund research that involves the creation or destruction of embryos. At the state level, it's a patchwork. Louisiana forbids embryo research. Michigan allows it. The 14-day rule also kicked a thorny social and philosophical problem down the road. 
In 1984, researchers could hardly keep embryos alive for a few days. The rule wouldn't impinge on researchers until 2016, when scientists first had to deliberately terminate lab-grown embryos at 13 days. But a couple of years before researchers hit this milestone, others were discovering that stem cells could reproduce some of the cell patterns and structures found in early embryos. Part 2. The Original Human Cell Embryoid The study that kicked off the conversation about building embryo models from stem cells was published in 2014, two years before the announcement of the 13-day embryo cultures. It was led by Eric Sidja, a professor of physical, mathematical, and computational biology, and Ali Brivanlu, who heads the Laboratory of Stem Cell Biology and Molecular Embryology, both at Rockefeller University. Brivanlu went on to lead one of those 13-day teams. But in his collaboration with Sidja, the group coaxed stem cells to differentiate into the three cell types that would go on to form all the organs and tissues of the body, a process called gastrulation. In a real embryo, these cell types layer on top of one another, inside a sphere of support tissues. In the model, the cells arranged themselves in concentric circles. Even so, they provided insights into gastrulation. The three cell types are ectoderm, mesoderm, and endoderm. The ectoderm primarily turns into skin and the nervous system, including the brain. In general, the outermost parts of our bodies. The endoderm mainly produces organs associated with fueling the body. The gut, the lungs, those that produce the hormones of metabolism. The mesoderm, in the middle, makes everything else, including muscle, bone, blood, the heart, and reproductive organs. In the cell cultures, the support cells form the outer ring, then the endoderm, the mesoderm, and in the center, the ectoderm. The team undertook this experiment because they were interested in cell signaling. How do cells talk to each other in order to organize themselves into an embryo? Sidja described it as a sort of black hole in our knowledge of human embryos, from implantation to about four weeks after conception. Sidja and Bravanlu's team set the stage with micropatterned plates, which encouraged the cells to form a colony with a radius and density similar to that of an epiblast. That's the set of stem cells that eventually goes on to become the fetus. Then, they exposed the cells to a growth factor called bone morphogenic protein, or BMP, which is known to trigger gastrulation in mammals. The cells took it from there. First, the cells on the outside started differentiating and becoming support tissues that would go on to form the placenta in a real embryo, among other things. They began sending out their own signals, known as Wnt and nodal. These signals can be thought of as very slow waves washing over the cells. Arya Wormflash, formerly a postdoctoral researcher under Sidja and Brevanlu, and now an assistant professor of biosciences at Rice University, has used this platform to continue exploring how chemical signals operate. One of his recent studies demonstrated that cells aren't just paying attention to the height of the Wnt and nodal waves. They also notice the time that passes in between their arrivals. Wormflash explained that if we think of a cell sitting somewhere and a cell sitting 100 microns away, they actually see the same profile of signaling, it's just displaced in time. So what happens for one cell will happen for the other hours later. In this way, cells figure out how far they are from the edges of the colony and whether they should be endoderm or mesoderm. The waves run out before they reach the center of the circle, so those should be ectoderm. Now, Wormflash is trying to work out how to get this happening in 3D rather than 2D. Three vertical layers encircled by a fourth, rather than four concentric circles. He's also connecting with clinicians to begin exploring how developmental problems arise using stem cells derived from patients. The ethical conversations begin. Most of us won't look at a bullseye-shaped colony and see human potential. But a professor of bioethics at Case Western Reserve, and now Harvard too, saw where this was going. In 2015, In Soo Hyun began writing about what gastrulating stem cells could mean for ethics. He researched bioethics and engineering ethics, eventually settling on the need for a new paradigm, bioengineering ethics. Because this isn't just about what you can do with living research subjects or the negative impacts that a technology may have on people. It's whether it is ethical to engineer a biological system that would normally be out of bounds experimentally, if it enables you to answer important questions. He wasn't alone. 
researchers at Harvard Medical School wrote a paper on synthetic human entities with embryo-like features, or sheafs. It was an early deep dive into what these embryo-like structures, no one yet agrees on a name, could mean for the 14-day rule. The 14-day rule treats human development like a road from a fertilized egg to a baby. That road can be blocked off well before those cells are widely believed to have achieved moral status. But existing stem cell protocols already allow researchers to build structures beyond that roadblock. For instance, Sigit pointed out that stem cell models of fetal brains already provide insights into how the Zika virus harms brain development. Part 4. Entering the Third Dimension Shortly after the publication of the Sheaf paper, Fu and Gamuccio made a splash in the press with their own work at the University of Michigan. They published a paper reporting a structure generated from stem cells that resembled part of a human embryo, an amniotic sac with an attached epiblast. MIT Technology Review ran an article called Artificial Embryos Are Coming and No One Knows How to Handle Them. Fu and Gamuccio were surprised by the headline. Their models represent only portions of particular moments in embryonic development, rather than being actual synthetic embryos. They arose as a side effect of trying to produce amnion, or the beginnings of the amniotic sac that protects a developing fetus. Until their 2016 paper, no one had ever reported making amnion from stem cells. They had suspected that the chemical signaling attempted before wasn't enough. The stem cells in the embryo needed a mechanical signal to know that they had implanted in the uterus, and it was time to make amnion. So, Fu's group made a mechanical model of the uterus, a thick, soft bed of gel for the uterine wall, covered with a layer of looser gel for the uterine lining. They achieved their goal. For the first time, they saw stem cells turning into amnion. But there was more. Sometimes, in addition to creating the ball of amnion, the set of stem cells retain their potential, lining up just like the cells in an epiblast. Fu said that before trying to make amnion, they never would have thought they could obtain these embryonic-like structures. He said that was the beauty of life sciences. Stem cells have these amazing self-organizing properties, and as scientists and engineers, they just provide the right culture conditions. They even observe cells differentiating in a way that resembles the posterior end of the epiblast, the part that goes on to form the lower portion of the fetus. Some interpret this as a rough representation of the primitive streak, a line that forms on the surface of the epiblast. It is the first indication of which end will be the head and which will be the rear. While it started out as a fluke, the team pursued this development, trying to understand why it happened. And, as Wormflash and his colleagues before them had found, it turned out that the size of the stem cell colony was critical. They also found that they didn't need the most controversial stem cells derived directly from embryos. Rather, reprogrammed adult stem cells could also form these synthetic amnion epiblast structures. In July 2019, Sidja and Bravanlu, the scientists behind the concentric circle embryonic models, came out with a new 3D model focused on the epiblast. The epiblast is normally a disc, known as the embryonic disc, but their new version is a spherical shell. Like Fu and Gamuccio, they've seen signs of the primitive streak, although in their shell it comes out as a sector rather than a line. Still, Sigis' team was able to see how some of the early signaling operates. They induced the cells in their shells to start differentiating with a dose of BMP, which caused the cells to begin producing Wnt, as in their earlier experiments. Where the primitive streak formed, the cells began producing a signal that inhibits Wnt, this might be part of the signal that tells the primitive streak to stop its march across the epiblast, defining the future head and rear ends of the body. Until a recent mouse embryo experiment reported in 2016, the epiblast wasn't thought to make a wnt inhibiting signal. That was believed to come from support cells. But even with this result from Sige's team, we can't be certain that this is the way that a real human embryo behaves. That is one of the challenges of using stem cells to model human embryos. We can see how well they align with the limited microscope images we have of real embryos. What we can't do is see how well the stem cells recreate the cell signaling. For that, we'd need embryo experiments beyond 14 days. Part 5. Stem Cell-Based Embryo Models as New Experimental Platforms Meanwhile, Fu had taken the implantation concept and done what engineers do, made the process very reproducible. Now. 
as reported in a paper published in the journal Nature, Fu and Gamuccio can make these essential pieces of the embryo in batches. Fu explained that in conventional 3D cell cultures, less than 5% of the stem cell cultures were turning into the embryonic sac-like structures. With the new microfluidic system, the success rate is about 95%. This consistency and scalability could enable the screening of medicines and chemicals for safety during pregnancy. In Su Hyun, the ethicist said that he really likes their approach because they're trying to model aspects of natural human embryos rather than trying to model every aspect of an embryo. If we can answer the research questions by modeling the system of interest within an embryo rather than recreating every part, he said that's probably a prudent way forward. Their new method relies on three tiny channels. The center channel is filled with a gel that serves as a model of the uterine wall. That's flanked by one channel that delivers stem cells and another that delivers chemical signals. Where there are breaks in the walls between the channels, the gel naturally forms little wells that capture the stem cells. The cells grow into colonies shaped like hollow balls, which then burrow into the gel. This mechanical signal, with help from the chemical signals in the device, helped turn some of the stem cells into amnion cells. This produced the amnion epiblast models that the team had seen before. And as before, the epiblast cells began to differentiate in a way that roughly resembled the posterior end. But, toward the end of the experiment, they saw a different kind of cell popping up in both the amnion and the epiblast parts. From their gene expression, these cells looked like primordial germ cells, the cells that go on to make eggs and sperm. These are expected to show up at about this time. Fu and Gamuccio's team also found that they could block wind, and the posterior-like differentiation wouldn't occur. This meant that the epiblast-like portion was on track to represent the head end of the embryonic disc. Gamuccio said that this method could help researchers to advance our understanding of early human development and develop new diagnostic tools for fertility problems. Even though their stem cell models are a far cry from true embryos, Fu and Gamuccio have carefully limited their experiments, ending them within five days after the cells begin to self-organize. Still, during the vetting process for their most recent paper, one of the scientists who reviewed it asked whether they could produce the missing support tissues. In other words, could they make a synthetic embryo that might have the potential to grow into a human? Fu and Gamuccio were taken aback that anyone would suggest they should have tried this. Mouse cells, however, have already started down this road. Teams at the University of Cambridge in the UK and in the Netherlands had independently generated whole synthetic mouse embryos by mixing the precursor cells from the mouse fetus and extra embryonic tissues. They were good enough facsimiles that they actually implanted in the wombs of mice, although they didn't grow into mouse pups. While no one has yet made the precursor cells for a human placenta and yolk sac, we should decide on ethical boundaries before this capability exists. Part 6 3D embryoids beyond 14 days. Carefully controlling the size of a stem cell culture to push cells toward embryo-like behaviors works even beyond the 14-day mark. This is what Alfonso Martinez Arias, a professor of genetics at the University of Cambridge in the UK, and his team have found. Although his team's experiments have so far focused on mouse stem cells, their approach represents a direction that human cell research could take. Martinez Arias started out asking, how an organism is built. He explained that previously this had been explored through genetics, knocking out one gene at a time to figure out what it did. But over the course of his career, he realized that building an organism is the business of cells, not so much the business of genes. So he began to look at how cells decide what to do, particularly in early development. His group's method collects clusters of stem cells in conventional microwell plates a plastic plate full of round divots that hold individual cell colonies. If those cells are in colonies the size of an epiblast, they'll begin gastrulation when they get a dose of wind. Martinez Arias's structures, called gastroloids, aren't exactly high-fidelity renditions of developing embryos. While real mouse embryos have definitive structures by the eight-day point, the gastroloids look more like clouds of cells in a general embryo-like shape. What they do have is all the right symmetries. The head is different from the rear, the belly is different from the back, and the right and left are mirror images of one another. And the individual cells are transforming as expected, differentiating into ectoderm, mesoderm, and endoderm. Then they go further, becoming recognizable organ-like cells, 
even though there aren't clear boundaries between tissues. Martinez Arias sees potential to better understand the chemical signals that tell cells what to become and when. Like other embryoids, the gastroloids aren't blocking wind, so they aren't on the path toward a brain. And as for ethics, Martinez Arias sees his embryoids as merely a branch of another field, organoids. Part 7. The Embryoid as an Organoid Perhaps the core of the abortion debate is whether an embryo is part of a woman's body or is its own entity. Answering to the orders of its own genes while also being totally dependent on its mother's body, it seems to be neither and both. From the viewpoint of the laboratory, however, growing a synthetic embryo is not so different from growing a synthetic kidney. Jason Spence, a professor of cell and developmental biology at the University of Michigan and an internationally recognized researcher in organoids, compares a clump of stem cells to a ball sitting at the top of a hill. He explained that they give a set of instructive cues to the cells. They sort of nudge the ball. But once the cells get going down that path, they have this intrinsic ability to keep moving that program forward, and that gives rise to these more complex structures. As with embryoid researchers... The organoid crowd doesn't produce whole organs at this point, although they'd like to. One or two cues can set the stem cells on a particular path, but they veer off if they don't continue to get the right signals. So how do you engineer a system that can continue sending the right signals? It isn't easy. Like organoids, each embryoid system has shortcomings because it's not getting the signals from tissues that are expected to be nearby. All of the researchers consulted for this story are interested in pursuing those next signals. They want to keep the stem cells on track to model human embryonic development. And while they all have personal lines they wouldn't cross, none of them believe they should be in charge of deciding where to stop. Hune doesn't think people are really that concerned about making liver models or heart models in a dish. But artificial gonads, synthetic embryos, synthetic brain-like structures... He said we need to carve out some new rules for working with these new entities. Part 8. A New Battleground for an Old Fight A popular way to argue that embryoids have no moral status, or at least limited moral status, is that without the embryonic support tissues, there's no potential for the stem cell model to develop into a baby. Sija asked, what's a human embryo? Something with the potential to become human and none of these things could become a human. Yet, for someone inclined to see the epiblast, the future fetus, is the only part that matters. Hune said that some people may view it as a baby that can't attach to the womb, like a little astronaut in space without a spaceship. Those people may say it's still a person, it just doesn't have the right support system. Both this argument and the no-potential argument ignore the critical role of the ultimate support tissue, the mother. Without her the risks to her life and health, and the permanent damage to her body, there is no potential for even a complete and healthy embryo. Unless, of course, we do want to culture embryos all the way to full term. But no one is talking seriously about that. What they want to do, as Hyun explained, is to model just enough to answer difficult questions. Part 9. Drawing up the rules. The conversation started in academia, but carving out the space for embryoid research will mean getting input from a broader range of people. Sometimes it is still the loudest voices that win the day. The reason embryo research in the U.S. can't be funded with federal tax dollars is because of a vocal minority. Already, the National Institutes of Health recently declined to fund new embryoid studies with the stem cells. It can also be hard to get the people who should have a say to come to the table at all, in the case of infertility, the pain and stigma of repeated early miscarriages may make people less likely to advocate for research that could improve assisted reproduction. Alison Murdoch, a professor of reproductive medicine at the University of Newcastle in the UK, is an advocate for embryo studies and fertility research. She observed that a couple who are having trouble getting pregnant are usually very reticent about standing on the rooftops and shouting about their problem. But her experience was very different when she was getting approval to prevent a serious genetic disorder with three parent in vitro fertilized eggs. Parents and people living with congenital health problems are often willing to campaign for research. She said that a parent whose child is dying is going to shout very loudly for help. The problems of two to six weeks after conception, the key period that future embryoids could explore, 
run between these extremes. But even if people are willing to talk, it's not easy to get a representative committee together, said Hyun. Everyday people who are interested may not be able to take time away from their jobs to participate in a symposium or contribute to a report. Now is the time to have the conversations about what we want out of this research, and what we don't. Fu and Gamuccio's system can generate thousands of early embryoids for purposes like drug screening, and other approaches are looking past the equivalent of 14 days. Meanwhile, Hyun has engaged Fu's team and the Harvard Medical School team to begin developing a framework for bioengineering ethics in this new field. They are collaborating on a grant from the Greenwall Foundation, which funds bioethics research, to identify problematic structures and come up with ways to limit them. That latter challenge, Hyun observed, can be trickier than anticipated. At one time, it was assumed that stem cells derived from an adult's body cells would never be capable of forming embryonic support tissues. It was believed that they could never go all the way back to pre-embryo states. But recent work suggests they can. As Hyun said, biology can always surprise you. It will be more organized or more lifelike than you originally thought it was capable of becoming. In fact, that's how Fu and Gamuccio's team ended up making an embryoid in the first place, when all they expected was amnion. Thanks for listening. If you want to hear more podcasts from Michigan Engineering, please subscribe to Reengineering Radio and review us wherever you listen to podcasts.